So I'm, be before I even get into it, I'm looking at the desktop. I see a gear with the letter D for the uh, the logo for the game, and it's it says Project Cyber, not uh, Arena Cyber Evolution. So that's kind of an interesting feature. We'll we'll talk about that in just a second, but I definitely want to get things started here. So. Where did you see Project Cyber written? So I Alt Tab, and when I look at my desktop, or when I look at my uh, my Start menu on the bar, I highlight it, and it says Project Cyber 32-bit DX9. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think uh, it might. I think I might know why. <laughs> <laughs> It, so actually, yes, the project used to be called uh, Project Cyber, but to be honest, uh, I should show what is the first thing we ever done for for this game. Uh, let me find it on YouTube. I will show it to you right now. Sounds and uh, the thing is, when we, we started on uh, Project Cyber, <laughs> it was called Project Cyber, we had honestly no freaking clue where we were going with this project. <laughs> because... Uh, we were kind of a bit out of font, <laughs> and we needed like something to with a shit with a crazy uh, momentum to happen super fast, and we needed it to be presented at PAX East in gotcha. April, whereas it was not even started in January. We started like mid January, <laughs> so okay. What we did is we s we made this video about the. Uh, Open uh, transparent development because we believe that it would become. We believe back then it would become a trend, and we we be, we also believe that this it is the best way, the most sane way and logical way based on current technology to develop a game. And uh, okay, I'm trying to find the video. Uh, uh, while you're trying to find that, I actually should run the the official little intro speech thing. So. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of Who's Gaming Now, Who's Developing Now show. Here we have the awesome folks, um, specifically Simon from Spearhead Games. Um, this is this is a developer of, among other things, Arena Cyber Evolution. That's the game that you've got uh, shown on the screen there. It is an awesome game. It is a 3v3 eSport sort of... Um, sports game it's not it's not like a uh you know a moba or anything like that where it's you know control the lanes and kill kill little squishy things to get money no not at all nothing like that it's a lot more like uh say like a football soccer rugby sort of feel to it very very awesome game so uh simon why don't you um let people know who you are introduce yourself tell them what you do on the project here Okay, so I found the video, so this is good news. So yeah, my name is Simo Darvo. I am, uh, but when you work at Indie, so normally my core job is game designer. This is what I've been doing most of my career for uh, for Ubisoft. So I've been a game designer on uh, Assassin's Creed 2, uh, a close design on Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, lead, lead game designer on 4, design director on uh, 3, <laughs> in this order. <laughs> Nice. So I, I, I <laughs> That's yes, pretty awesome. I, I, yes. <laughs> because actually I was uh, I was the first employee on Assassin's Creed uh, 4 and then they needed help on 3 so I went on 3 after I was on 4. <laughs> so um and then uh, I st I st uh, we started uh, this uh, studio Spearhead game with Malik because uh, uh we really felt like uh, there there is so much room for innovation and bring new idea and to develop games in a new way, a, a more uh, uh, sane way, <laughs> we felt. And uh, there's tons of products that were not even uh, thought about so far. So we just wanted to explore a bit more, to innovate, to uh, make our, some gameplay R&D. This is more or less like our core uh, as a studio to kind of find uh, break through. We are, we are we are actually trying to find new ways to do new things. This is what we are about. And what I do in the studio actually is, uh, but for for our first game, I was mostly I would say level design director and producer. <laughs> so uh, I am but I, I am what at Ubisoft they called me the closer. <laughs> so I am really good at 
making stuff happen. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I am always producer, but in this case, uh, right now uh, at the current uh, moment, I am actually UI uh, user interface game designer because I felt like this was one of the topics that as a designer, <laughs> when you are in the triple industry, it is the topic you, are, you always want to stay away from because it sounds to be the less prestigious place you can be. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, I, I ju we just kind of realized that, uh, yes, it's cool. We are good at making gameplay. We prototype fast. We are good at innovating. But at one point, uh, our presentation skills are really not on par with industry standard. And we need to get better at, at that. We need to learn and understand how the meta works, how the UI works. And I decided to tackle it. So right now, I am in the process of learning this expertise. So you will see in the next patch a freaking huge boost on this aspect. Uh, right now, when you play, you see the current UI, which kind of was honestly a bit neglected. We did not put much focus so far on it. But, uh, and Tiny Brains had the same issue as well. So I decided that, OK, let's stop being all about gameplay and like consider and learn about the other aspect uh, needed to make a good game as well. <laughs> I agree. Uh, something that I say a lot of times when I come across a clunky game is that it's not um, violent games or you know the graphics of the games that make people violent. It's poor interfaces and you know <laughs> poor UI and that sort of stuff because it makes a frustrating gameplay experience. And being frustrated is what really makes people angry and 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 violent. So. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, all the violent about video game uh, talks about the wrong topic. Right? Yeah, <laughs> like he, he, here's here's the case in point. If I'm doing really good at like say Call of Duty on a console or something, I'm just shooting people left and right. I'm celebrating, but I'm not like throwing my controller across the room. Versus I'm playing like some some horribly murderous puzzle platformer that's got smooth controls, like say Super Meat Boy. And I'm just, the frustration is building up, and finally I'm like right at the last thing, the last little buzzsaw just barely catches me. Ah, and I throw my controller across her. You see, Super Meat Boy isn't necessarily a violent game. It's, I mean, it's almost the character suffering a whole lot, but it's more the idea that a game that's frustrating is, is what's going to make people really angry about the subject. So, um, you know, frustrating to play. And I wouldn't say that uh, Ace is necessarily frustrating in its current state, though there are some things that I would like to get a little bit more information on, like um, when me and two other players are all kind of grouped up trying to fight back and forth for who has the disc. Uh, sometimes it gets confusing to tell, you know, what what series of actions you need to be the one who grabs the disc and gets away with it versus somebody else doing it. Sometimes it almost feels like it's, you know, up to latency if you're playing against uh, players with a little bit of distance between them. Um, so I guess that's something that I, I, I would want maybe a little bit more clarity on because that's, I would say, the biggest thing where... I, I feel like I don't have any control over the situation that if I get if I come out with a disc I get lucky so um, okay so you, you mentioned a lot of different issues and uh, most of them are getting addressed right now so one of them is latency um, so yeah right now uh, the way uh, so we t honestly when we released the game we thought that peer-to-peer -peer architecture would be good enough because also to be honest, it's gated server architecture is way more complicated to set up, more expensive to maintain, and uh, like it takes a lot of bandwidth. Uh, so we hoped that peer-to-peer -peer would do the trick, but like in the current non-optimized -opti uh, ver uh, version of the game, um, if you so since it's a peer-to-peer -peer architecture, it means that among the sys player, one of them will be chosen to be the the host. So if the, the if this host does not have a great computer, a great internet connection, and the will to not cheat. <laughs> yeah. Um, you will not have a good experience. So it, it tends to ruin uh, experience for a lot of people. So we kind of decided to address it by uh, by developing it uh, with powerful dedicated server. And we did try for the first time on Thursday and Friday, and it works. We have a server now in Oregon, uh, uh, based on Amazon. And finally, we have a good experience, which means that Having a bad experience will only be caused by you having a bad connection or you <laughs> having a bad, which yeah. is which is which is legit, right? If you don't have a good, if you 
So if you have a good connection, you should have a good experience and you will with the dedicated server. So this will fix this part. As for the confusion, uh, like when a lot of people want to, uh, to get the puck at the same time, we are developing simple communication tool. We don't want to support chat. It's, a, it's an open decision we've made because like of toxic player, we don't like, it's easy like to uh, start trolling each other and uh, have a, a game that will be filled, that becomes filled with hate. <laughs> So uh, what we want is to actually give you, for, for starter, two different commands. One of them will say, pass me the, pass me the puck. <laughs> it will put an exclamation mark uh, over your head. It will make the pass line blink. And it, so it will be the, the, the one button to say, I, I am uh, available. Please send me the puck. And the other uh, button will, will say, I got it. <laughs> So when you are going toward the puck, it will just like highlight the puck and it will put a line between you and it to kind of signify to everyone that it's, it's yours. So these two commands we feel will, will fulfill 90% of what the player are trying to say to each other. Now, so, I, this is, this is going to be almost a, a weird implementation to try to do, but is there any way you'd be able to implement with the microphone to actually pick up when a player says that uh, one of those two commands or something they've recorded that they use to um, communicate that command in game so that way they don't need to reach away from their their gameplay area in order to communicate that and if voice integrations actually uh, implemented that they would actually be able you know the other people would actually hear it on top of seeing it visually honestly uh, it sounds like a freaking good idea <laughs> we did not consider it yet but uh... I, I, w I, w I will discuss it with Malik on Monday. I really like the idea. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, because we were kind of, we were also uh, struggling at what is the so we wanted to put it like on uh, E and Q, but uh, right now we cannot because we are supporting Azure C at the same time as uh, uh, a Quirt C, and it 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 makes that uh, some of these buttons are already taken. So and we don't want to put them too far. So we w we could not figure what was the best control for these commands. And I do admit that potentially, if there was a way to just say them, uh, it would be just be way better because it is what intuitively you do anyway when you play. So what are uh, Z X and C used for? I can't quite recall. What is what? The the uh the keys Z X and C. Uh, by Z uh, is the same as W because on the Azure C French keyboard, <laughs> the Z is that uh, is, is it occupy the space that W occupies. So oh, okay. Instead of instead instead of uh, having W A S D, they have Z A S D. I see, because that's on so a. We, uh, we kind of. We support multiple uh, keyboard configuration with with single uh, button mapping. So this is why there are some button map at location that you don't understand why exactly. I get you. Well, that that actually it makes sense, but I guess that's where I would put it if I was trying to make a um, uh, a really quick place to hit the things is just you know press Z for I got it or press X for pass it to me or something like that because it's just it's it's very close to where you're already at. And it's not like you're, you know, doing more than uh, at most a very quick break from the action to uh, move your finger over to hit it. But you know, it's something that can be worked out. There's there, there's plenty of time to work on the project and work through that sort of stuff. And there might be many like best solutions for it. So I'm definitely excited to see you know what what gets worked out for it. Yeah, definitely. This this is something that uh, we will keep iterating on and. Uh, I think that it does make sense for us to do uh, the project in such a transparent way because uh, it's a, it's honestly do, do you know uh, Elric de Melnibane this uh, this uh, series of uh, of books no. have you ever read no, he has I a he has, he has a sword that is called Stormbringer <laughs> and Stormbringer is in this uh, novel the most powerful full uh, uh, sword that, ex that exists in the world, but it's very dangerous as well because it has its own intelligence and it wants also to possess <laughs> the, the bearer as much as the bearer wants to possess it. And I do feel like right now this is what community is. It's the most powerful, strongest, and like uh, edgiest sword in the world, but at, at the same time it can uh, really burn you. And I speak about ab about it because I have some of my friends uh, in the indie community that are developing transparently and that are getting raped right now by, by their community. 
So it is really kind of a risky thing to do, but I felt like it was the right one to do for us since we are really um, sincere in our effort to involve the community in it. And we are also extremely efficient and fast in developing the game. <laughs> so uh, yes, we are really in this mindset where we do listen to what people Oh no! <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> I hope the internet didn't die over there. <laughs> Oops! <laughs> oh man. Skype! <laughs> well, while that's, uh, while that's going on, I can, uh... Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear okay, you. Okay, so I, I am speaking on my phone right now because for no apparent reason my PC decided to shut down to, uh, to update or I don't know what, so... Uh... <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> 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 so anyway, I don't know where you lost me, but my point was actually to say that we are, uh, yes, we, we keep developing the game and we do listen very closely and we actually make <laughs> table and stats with uh, that, um, that showcase what are the feedback that comes the most, what are the sentences that are said the most often on the forum, on Twitter, everywhere. We just make a, a pool of that and we make sure to always address what is felt like the greatest, the biggest issue. It doesn't mean that we are listening like precisely to what people tell us what uh, to do, because sometimes when some t someone tells you something, it might mean that the same Tom is not exactly what he thinks, but what we do believe is that if you say something, there is a problem. <laughs> Right, right. So we we are in the process of really uh, tackling uh, the most efficiently possible, and honestly, I think it starts progressively paying off because more and more the YouTuber and journalists who are reviewing the game are the guys who who reviewed it like three or four months ago or six months ago, and they see the freaking crazy difference. And honestly, what we did like because we are seventh month in the project now. At, uh, this this level of momentum does not exist anyway. So I think that for us, in our case, it's really uh, it's really paying to uh, open ourselves and like to showcasing. And what I like also is um, what I like also is that uh, we have made a Twitch every single day at 7 p.m. on our channel, and we have archived this all these uh, episodes on YouTube, which means that if we are ever like really successful, for instance, we will have the recipe and the manual of instruction of how do you get from you have no clue what you're doing to you have a successful game and the entire recipe will be like stated on our channel and we will be proud to share that with the, the developer community as well as the players. Well, okay, but keep in mind, this is a recipe that also comes from a bunch of veterans with a really you know, huge background in developing and, and producing games. I don't know if an indie crowd would be able to like, oh, yeah, we can we can just do this, because, well, they might have the time and the passion, even the skill, they might not have the same kind of organizational skills as, you know, you, you guys have worked on a lot of stuff. I'm sure you've had a, uh, uh, you know, been under under the pressure and, you know, really a lot of things even before working on this project and it sounds like this project you guys have just been kind of constantly under pressure and constantly <laughs> yes. you know working and continuing with things i i suppose that yeah part of what makes us ex that fast is the fact that we want to survive <laughs> makes sense so uh, so yes it does really fuel us but when i say uh, the crowd i do agree that we have like some like we have no programmer that has la less than 10 years of experience, for instance. Yeah. So yes, we have like strong guys. But for me, so I think that there's a, there are kind of m multiple principles that for anyone, uh, it could give them a head start to at least figure where do you start from. Like for, for, for instance, what was the first thing we did when we started to make the game? And uh, how did, so what was the foundation and how did we build the game around 
which foundation. So I think this is great to know. But for me, any game developer, any veteran AAA game developer, in my opinion, is a future indie. <laughs> for me, it is super clear that the uh, industry is making a huge shift right now. And when, when, if you just watch in Montreal, there's there has been like so right now there's 52 identified indie company in Montreal, 48 of which were funded after 2010, which means that actually all the veterans, all the strong, talented guys from the AAA industry are right now in the process of developing a new sector of the industry, building like a studio that are about creation and about expressing what they want to express and about like really craftsmanship and not production. So this is happening right now. And I do believe that that anyway, the, the paradigm of uh, video game development is in the process of really switching from production to uh, innovation. I think this is what's happening. And and th th this means that Indie will become like, I think that uh, it's not, Indie is not the right, it's not the right way to, uh, to, uh, to explain it, but by Indie, what I mean is innovative studio and not production studio. Right. I think those, those will, will grow, they will multiply and they will like cover, in my opinion, maybe 80% of the industry by 10 or 20 years. <laughs> it definitely seems like, you know, people having the independence to work on things the way they want to is really helpful. And, you know, I know a lot of people go from a large company like uh, Disney or um, uh, Microsoft or... Ubisoft or you know there's a lot of huge companies out there and they'll go and make a small company and they'll make an awesome game and you know it'll be a lot of fun one other thing that I really appreciate about what what you guys are doing is whoops I missed that one uh, I I really never liked the fact that Ubisoft was really closed like I would see them at conventions all the time just missing these <laughs> I would constantly see them at conventions at E3 and GDC, and I'd constantly be trying to um, follow up with them about the Might and Magic series because me and my friends were really uh, big fans of Legends of Might and Magic, and we'd been trying to see if we could get access to uh, the source code so we could upgrade the game and um, you know do more with it and kind of breathe more life into it. And, we never really got to hear back from them. It wasn't until one of our buddies actually started up a pretty substantial fan project that um, we 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 really started getting any um, you know any of us got any word. And that was like you know ten years after the game was you know after 3DO was um, uh, you know bankrupt and sold off the the Might and Magic series of Ubisoft. So they definitely very closed off and we just really couldn't get in contact with them at all. So that's a completely different contrast to what we've got right here. You guys have got this game going for a very short period of time and yet you've been extremely public about it and you know really community forward. That's that's something that really helps and it really um, it, it's great for making sure that the the people who are playing the game are giving the you know basically the best feedback and the best um, best information they can beyond just the data that you guys can already collect from watching games um, it's great like it's 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 such an awesome powerful way to develop S more companies have been taking it on Sony online working on it quite a bit um, these guys are just duking me out I keep forgetting to do my right click <laughs> but to be honest, to be honest, I have the intimate conviction that this will have a tremendous impact on how every every future video game in the future will be developed. But I, I think that it will reshape honestly everything else as well. <laughs> what I mean is, yes, uh, the game developer we are quite edgy. We are kind of uh, like using the latest technology in the very innovative way and. Therefore, we are doing ways and we are, we are doing things in ways that were never experimented before. We tend to be like doing stuff before the other industries. But for me, it seems clear that with the current current technology and medias and like uh, tools that we have as a species, <laughs> we can have anyone at any moment on the planet on any problem. 
when required, as long as required, and this is what we are going toward, right? And I think that the way we manage ourselves, like in terms, I would say, almost as politics, in the the way we create, we have, we the way we manage any single creative project will be re re completely reshaped. I think that like. The way most of our stuff work still today is based on old principle and like it's not based on it does not really take into account the fact that in my pocket at any moment of the day I have access to every person in the world and all the knowledge of our PC pretty much <laughs> yeah so this is this is where we are now so I do believe that for me the way we are still developing most game does not make any sense anymore and I do believe like that um, if we start developing the culture and the methodology and the way to leverage all this collective intelligence, we will just grow <laughs> massively <laughs> as a as a species. <laughs> Pretty this much. Is, for I mean... me, this is more than this is more than video game. This is this is where we are, and this is the challenge we're facing. And for me, where, where, whenever you are developing video games and you're not challenging new avenues, trying to find new ways to do things or try, uh, trying to create new types of things, you are not fulfilling your role and responsibility in my opinion. <laughs> That's true. Was that was that something that you felt was kind of lacking um, with more of the corporate stuff that you were doing before you started with Spearhead? If it, if it was something that, me that missed with what? That... that like was kind of lacking like when you were working on the Assassin's Creed series did you feel like there was really a lot of kind of progress and development going on there it was did you feel like it was just kind of grinding sequels at some point and you know just you know minimal upgrades and minimal new technology and things coming out of it but to be honest um for me, it, it would not reach the level of challenge and innovation that I need to reach. I um, get you. I, 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 do, I do respect Ubisoft, honestly. I do believe that as far as big AAA companies go, they are doing quite well and they are, try they, they are bringing new stuff on the table constantly. I mean, uh, Assassin's Creed 4 it might not be the most innovative game of all, all times, but it's, it certainly is not the least innovative <laughs> game of all times. So right. it's kind of, it's, as far as big studio go, I do do like how they iterate, how they they kind of take a project and they switch it from team to team, and that that kind of add each time a new thing to it. So they are, they have a lot of good of good things, but um, in terms of culture, I do believe that um, much more can be achieved with video games uh, than um, products. <laughs> and uh, for me, I needed to kind of go and build my own uh, thing to see where I, where I could uh, lead this boat. So this is the, uh, I wanted to explore, uh, explore uh, new avenues. And to be honest, um, being, I do realize that being too innovative and being too edgy is not much better for your mental uh, stability. <laughs> In the sense that uh, when you don't know where you're going and you don't have predefined solution and you don't have like, um, Establish uh, knowledge of what you're doing in your uh, in your uh, community. It creates like tons of problems that are extremely complicated to to, to solve and that like put you in, in a state where it's uh, it's a bit difficult. So I do under, so 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 it's a, it's a question of it's a matter of balance. And honestly, uh, potentially we have been counterbalancing a bit too much. <laughs> So we are trying. We have trying. We are trying to find our sweet sweet spot right now. But uh, yes, I, I, the reason why I, I left is because I I wanted to explore to see what we could explore, and I just felt like okay. My my feeling basically was that it did not make that much sense to keep um, following the same trade routes <laughs> that we know, <laughs> where the entire ocean deserve to be explored and there are so many massive things to be discovered if you go out of the trade routes this is how yeah, i felt <laughs> i get you i get you yeah i i can see i mean i would say that a lot of the uh larger studios are starting to get better about getting more innovation in the games but you know compared to what we see with indie developers it's it's you know i i almost think of the um the 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 old you know French art salon thing where you know that's where you'd have the uh, the art put up everywhere and 
that's where art culture rated everything and there was certain hierarchy of things that were considered I, fine once again art. i am switching back to, i am switching back to my pc so i i, I just need to uh all right to close my phone okay one second I promise I'm coming to a good point here, folks. Alright, let's actually get a real game going here. Do you hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. Okay, alright, sorry for the interruption. That's uh, fine. Alright, so I'm starting up an online game right now. I see two more players found. That's totally awesome. Um, so anyway, what I was going to be saying is the um, the idea of the, the, the French art salons, uh, I think it was late 17s, early 1800s, um, where all of the the fine art had to be things that fell into these certain categories and something that deviated in different ways um, those were the things that really pissed people off the 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 hoity-toity art community but those are the things that we look back in history as being the masterpieces of the era as well as the things that you know we really remember as things that defined the time it wasn't um, you know the 500 female nudes that Joe Schmo did it was the the one where the the females are looking at the you know the the viewer instead of away from the viewer that was the one that made everyone mad and that was the one that uh you know will remember to this day so but uh, you know the, I, the, 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 the thing for me uh, so I, I like your comparison but I think one that I I like even more is I feel uh because like uh, this is uh, this is uh, in terms of art, and I do believe that video game could be an art, even though it's not my core message. But what I do believe is it is the most powerful media. It like involves uh, putting multiple person in contact through uh, interactive interface, and it it is way more powerful than writing, for instance, in terms of what could be achieved and developed and created with it, right? And we discovered this thing like more or less 30 years ago, right? And uh, so image and people, I, I, I have talked with some people at some point to say, telling to me, yes, but like most of game I've been discovered yet, right? It's like now we just keep iterating, but like, and I'm, the fuck? <laughs> we developed this media 30 years ago. Imagine 30 years after the inv invented writing, how much they were far from discovering that you can store information, you can... You can create a political current using writing. You can make a novel, a poem, a, like all those things that took freaking thousands of years to discover. And we are like at the freaking baby, like early baby state of what can be done with this medium. So seriously, for me, like at this point, it does not make sense to kind of. I, I, I was getting crazy. I was getting crazy, honestly, because it makes no point to. It makes no sense to get confined in this. It, what we discovered when the media did not even started, in my opinion, is we are not like even at one percent of what we can do with this thing. It's obvious <laughs> that this thing will become like grandiose and like it will encompass every other sphere of the society, society and it will just keep. Uh, and I think that finally, what we see right now is the bricks cracking a bit. We see like finally, like the current structure cannot prevent the the current the current from flowing it's uh, like with stories like minecraft riot like people who establish new things new way to do things um, and that that don't cost a fortune so this is what is cool with those games is that th these are smaller projects uh, but okay riot uh, has become gigantic but it started as a smaller thing that is an rts where you control one character <laughs> yeah and uh, and uh, and now they are kind of uh, they, they, they prove that when you have a smart, ingenious, new, no, no, uh, innovative idea, you can, uh, you can actually generate as much as when you have an army of 10,000 people uh, doing your work and they build just a massive cathedral. So uh, I do believe that we are seeing the beginning of this change of area and I do believe that if we leverage it properly, we can really generate a current of optimism and that we can uh, influence the society in a good direction. <laughs> uh, 
absolutely and I, I say that um, video games are really the most advanced form of art that exists but really the most advanced technology as well in terms of art it's because it takes all forms of art that existed before and encompasses them in one one specific media and I would say the same is true of technology as well be it um, you know computers or mobile devices getting into virtual reality we have games that aren't even you know visual that are played 100% audio um, you know things are things are pretty awesome with games and like you said it really is just the start um, as technology improves as um, the ability to make games and scoring mechanisms improves um, we're gonna be able to do a lot more stuff all sorts of just real-world sorts of games um, like you, you know <coughs> I could see something being built into cars like the 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 closer you come to you know slowing down at at right exactly where the the stripe is on your car when you're you know at a stop sign or a stoplight or something uh, the more points you get so people get better at driving just because there's a game that rates them on you know how close they're getting and how uh, how slowly they're coming into it or how quickly they're coming into it or whatever uh, I'm sure there's better examples that's I guess the best one I could come up with while I'm trying to uh, not get defeated here <laughs> Yes, I'm watching your match at the same time as well. <laughs> no, but uh, yes, I, I think that uh, what uh, video game has made is they created a new uh, a, <laughs> a new type of uh, worker that are abs uh, actually psychological R&D <laughs> guys. Like we are game designer, psychological researcher. This is the core of our job, right? What we do is we create artificial interactive context. We observe. <laughs> people's behavior in those contexts and we iterate on the context until they uh, generate the right stimuli in the brain, right? This is actually what we fundamentally do. So I do believe that we are kind of cracking more and more. And uh, the, the, the funny thing is what we are doing, uh, what like in terms of finance, what the most successful of us are doing is they are trying to kind of uh, create this um, uh, Skinner box that uh, encourage this one behavior that is spend money. So they kind of create a software that uh, reward player who spend money from their credit card. Actually, if you if you watch it from a high level perspective, this is what Candy Crush does, right? And uh, so the thing is, we are tracking more and more how the brain works. And as opposed to many of uh, other people who kind of look at uh, the brain. Like in our case, it's really measurable how well we did because like the the ones of us, we do succeed. It, you can measure in million of dollars how much money they, they get. So we are the guys who make research on uh, uh, brain psychology. And when we succeed, uh, we, we make millions of dollars, which means that we never, there were never were people like studying as closely and, and intensively this uh, this aspect of the uh, of the people, and this means that once we will have understood better and like mapped it better, uh, we will be able if if good wins wins against evil to use actually this knowledge to reinforce good behavior and commendable uh, attitude and stuff like that. And I do agree that this is. This is where we could go. I, I do believe, like right now, people think that free-to-play uh, is uh, the end of real gaming and that uh, like uh, it's evil everywhere. It's just the beginning, Honestly. actually. I I love it. <laughs> but I do believe there is actually a war of good versus evil. There is like the guys like Riot who don't make a large RPU average revenue per user. Actually, they almost make the worst RPU of the industry. <laughs> but they are kind of trying to build something clean and durable and like where they would be able to rely on their community they are really they really have the intention and uh, the objective and it's not just fake i spoke with uh, tons of their developer and they are really in this mindset that they want to establish something clean and something great and there's like those who just are trying to um, <laughs> the way they the way they they look at the problem is how can we incite and encourage the maximum amount of spend ex uh, uh, from the player. How can we? So they try to figure what was this stimuli that uh, made the player uh, spend, and they try to reinforce and enlarge it and to make it happen more often right. and more efficiently. And those are evil. So there is like the battle of good versus evil right now. 
but like if like uh, if uh, the technology allows for as much breakthrough as I believe it, it does, I believe that we will become more optimistic and more <laughs> inclined to do good. <laughs> So, um, I, I, I will definitely say there are some violators out there like Nexon selling uh, $20 for pretty underwear and Vindictus. That's that that that's a little weird to me, but they, they keep on making those sales. Um, and I suppose people being able to customize the gameplay experience they want to, but... Um, no, I, I definitely agree with you. Like something that the, the the monetization model can definitely be something that um, you know really shows if they're they're there for the players or if they just want a cash grab. And it's it's something that you can really tell just by looking at the prices of things, how much it costs to buy their their currency versus how you know what you can actually get with it. And some games are really good about it, and you know some games and companies, some games and companies are really bad about it. But um, I would say that a lot of what Riot's doing is really awesome because not only do they have all the things that you can spend money on, but honestly, there's a lot of things that you don't need to spend money on. You know, just be able to get your character at the most powerful level. You can just do that with regular gameplay, and you get there pretty quickly. So, I mean, there's there's definitely none of that, like, pay to win, or, you know, you can't buy skins that make it easier to play in any way. Um, so I've just... Unlocked. Yeah, but it, it, it is also like Kickstarter. So Kickstarter is used by two different types of people, people who are really credible and who do really believe in the future of this thing and who want to uh, develop more openly their community and get budget based on, like, what their community believes. And there are the guys who actually are trying to use it as a scam, who don't have a real project, they don't have a real portfolio, and they don't have a real objective to create a project, and that really, uh, they don't know really how to make a project, and they will really burn themselves. So in both cases, uh, I, I, I think that like, yes, you can make more money if you really try to make money, <laughs> But at the same time, if you do respect your community, if you are really si sincere and legit in uh, what you're trying to accomplish, then you will get your next Kickstarter and your next Kickstarter and your next Kickstarter and you will actually build something that grows instead of just like getting a quick cash uh, grab and going nowhere with it. So I do believe that actually good has also a strong uh, reason to exist because uh, it's also more, much more beneficial as well, I think, in the long term to be respectful and to be uh, sincere in what you say. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. That's and I've I've seen a lot of projects that were kickstarted and came with the best of intentions, but ah, I keep hearing that glass rolling around or whatever it is, <laughs> some sort of weird like glassy or ceramicy sound over in your end. But anyway. Um, yeah, a lot of I've seen a lot of projects that have, you know, the best of intentions, but they falter and fail because of either, um, you know, not knowing what they're doing, or they know what they're doing, but they overspend on stuff. Um, I I I don't want to start just naming off projects, but um, that there is one, or actually two, Mighty Number no. Nine, I believe, they raised like just a just a shit ton of money. But they spent it all really quickly, and when they did their video apologizing and asking for more, begging for more money, I realized where it all went. It was that nice fancy office that they've got for everybody. So, <laughs> um, you know that, and then they—if you want to back it after uh, the the campaign or whatever—now there's the slacker backers or whatever. It's like, oh, well, you were too lazy to back us the last time, so now you can now you can still do it. That's I don't know. I I think that's. Um, but yeah, so those, those those guys, so yes, they did get money, and I think they did get again money <laughs> when they they re asked for it. But um, honestly, they are not like working really in uh, the sense of their own interest by not fulfilling their the promise. Because if they did, for instance, really delivered the mighty number nine the way they promised and like uh, with the money that uh, should have been sufficient to do it. I don't know. I don't know what were the issue. I don't want to judge them. I am not really that much aware of this one, but I'm just using that as a, a screw right. case. <laughs> right. Uh, so I'm, because I'm not judging this specific case, I don't know enough about, but what I'm saying and what I'm saying is just if 
they did deliver like in a very nice and efficient and uh, timely fashion then they could ask again to the community and they would receive again and honestly the one i am extremely scared about right now i hope they do deliver is uh what's the name a uh, stars uh, the one that, uh, that star I citizen like yes seriously this one has to work Fuck. it yeah yeah i think well i don't think the um like the eve community and other big communities like that will let it um there's a lot of games out there that have a lot of that appeal but don't quite have the scale so the fact that Star Citizen really is like the real deal, that's totally awesome, and I'm I really do hope it does well. I haven't really played it myself. I uh, watched no, some people play it a bit, and it seems like a lot of fun. Yeah, the the this is one of the projects that really opens those new gate and that like uh, uh, allow people to uh, fund and uh, participate in a project. And I think that I, I really hope that the, the thing is, they, so much money has been put as this one, and this is so high profile that if it does not work, it will really hurt. <laughs> it will hurt everyone. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can think of another project that had some issues that was unfortunately Pantheon Rise of the Fallen, where. Uh, Brad McQuaid, who is one of the creators of EverQuest, and then um, Vanguard Saga of Heroes, which just um, just was discontinued this year. Um, unfortunately, he kind of embezzled a bunch of money from the project and did that prematurely. And then when they were out of money, he came out and issued an apology saying, yeah, I totally embezzled a bunch of money. But hey... We're still going to continue with development of the game. It's just going to be volunteer only going forward. So you know the game's still going to happen. It's just not not going in a way that you know really feels well managed. And um, it you know it I get when when somebody comes out and says, "Hey, yeah, I took a bunch of money from the project. Sorry, folks." It it doesn't really seem very genuine. It seems like somebody that was kind of out for themselves, and oh yeah, they're leveraging this project to kind of make ends meet or whatever. Um, I hope it gets made, and I hope it's a good game. But um, it's a really unfortunate circumstance for things to go that way. Now, to be honest, to be honest, making a game is extremely hard. Honestly, it is the hardest thing you can ever do because you need. To be, on one hand, extremely creative and open and like uh, discussion prone and like just humble and with the vision to uh, really like catch the opportunities that happen and like all the sensitivities, uh, uh, qualities. But at the same time, you need to be extremely firm, <laughs> rational, able to close, kill, like shut down, cut, like all, all those. And you need to kind of be extremely good at both. And you need to have like this internal meter to know exactly at at which moment you need to uh, to where you have to put the meter to uh, at this moment of the project. And I do understand that like uh, when you are attached to your feature to the idea that if you add just this one more week, it could add this feature that would give sense to everything that that you developed so far. And honestly, at one point, uh, if you don't are if you're not rational enough. You will. Uh, it's it's never just one week. It's one more month, and then it causes tons of more bug. And like, if you don't have like the cleverness, to, so and so so this is one thing that actually Ubisoft did teach me. Like like you you do learn how to ship, close, finish, and honestly, I do understand that like if you did not receive like uh, the proper training and the the right habits, like finishing a game, honest honestly, even when you are well trained. You suffer, and this is like something emotionally hard, and it it is there's no way for it to be easy. So I do believe that you need to be extremely well trained, trained, and in super good mental health during the duration of the process of the project. Both of these things, otherwise uh, it, it is it is about to fail. So so I do understand that uh, the, the project tend to fail. It's uh, it's really a difficult thing to to make happen, and uh, and each time I, I I have this concept that I call the soul point. <laughs> because um, uh, depending on how hard is a project, I do believe that I have a limited amount of soul points. <laughs> and each time I, each time I finish a, a project, I spend a couple of soul points. <laughs> 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 kind of investing yourself in each project, yeah. But I, I do believe that I can achieve so much before, like my <laughs> my soul is completely corrupted. <laughs> no, no, but no, but. 
the, the picture is just to tell you how difficult I, I I consider it is to to make a game happen properly. So for me, I kind of developed this expression of soul point to kind of represent the level of uh, pain and personal investment that is required to ship a game through the door. So it it it, it does require to kill some. It, it it requires to kill something innocent that does not deserve to die and to kind of do, <laughs> no no but you, no but you you need to be able to do that. <laughs> Yeah, no, I know what you mean. No, but this is a this is one of my tricks when I need to close. I do sometimes what I what I do call kill in a sense, and this is the 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 the, the one uh, technique that I use to make everyone realize that now it needs to be finished. So what killing in a sense for me is to cut a feature that people wanted and that did not really needed to be cut. <laughs> Because uh, that makes everyone realize, okay, fuck, if we don't finish, we are in this set, in this state of mind where things are getting removed from the game. So it kind of switched the toggle in everybody's mind that, okay, now we need to finish our thing and make it work properly. Otherwise, uh, uh, stuff is getting removed now from the game. It kind of opened this... Uh, <laughs> did, this. did you ever put in X features... Um, when you worked on projects at Ubisoft, things that were really awesome features that people were excited about, but you knew going into it, when it gets towards the end of the project, these are the ones I'm going to drop the axe on first to really light the fire under everybody. So what is your question if, it, if I ever saw it? If, if you ever you know, went into a project introducing features that you know that you would end up getting rid of later on specifically like to 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 get people you know in action and if you never have to do that then hey you've got three new awesome features that you can get in the game that wouldn't have been there before anything like that uh, or not really <laughs> i am i am more the other guy i am the guy who removed the features more than the, the, the guy who but Honestly, uh, I think I, I have been well trained. I had this uh, lead game designer that was called Patrick Lord, who has been actually the creative director for Child of Light. He is a really a strong design closer, probably the best one that that, that is in Montreal. And I think that having him over above me really taught me really well about all those concepts. This is uh, really like a mastery that I uh, acquired acquired. Uh, early in my career so I would be more uh, the guy who helped people with that than people who would have problem with that <laughs> gotcha 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 free this week so you do have rotations of uh, which guys are free each week which uh, um, players what what are they actually referred to as we call them runners so yeah we did not uh, talk too much about the game so far <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, uh, yes, we have uh, eight, uh, so at the moment of the next push, that should be... So we wanted November 3rd, but we th but right now we are aligning to actually have a somewhat stealth push on November 3rd, where we uh, uh, push the dedicated server, but just with our community, and we don't make any marketing push, and we just uh, stabilize it uh, for one week before uh, making the real media push. So at the, real, uh, at the moment of the real media push, November 10th, we will have eight champions. So there's two new guys coming, a new goalie and a new striker. And there will be two uh, character free each week. Nice. Yeah, goalie so, is something I've been wondering about because I've only been seeing the negotiator on both sides. So yes, we have a new one. Uh, uh, honestly, he, but he's called Sentinel. He looks a bit like uh, an Apple product. I feel he is another <laughs> robot. <laughs> <laughs> so he is another robot, but more uh, round uh, and slick. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, honestly, I think I think he is cooler than uh, personally. I, I prefer play him than uh, than uh, Negotiator. He is a bit less aggressive because negotiator can be a bit uh, more aggressive in the sense that his uh, right click power uh, can allow him to push the guys back and uh, while they hold the, 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 the disc and uh, he can also teleport back which means that it's easy for him to support the attack without taking too many ri too much risk so this other one is a bit more defensive oriented but uh, so his secondary of the new one is to create uh, an energy pillar that will remind them for a few seconds so he can, uh, he can, for instance, uh, block the path to someone or cover part of the goal. And his ultimate power create like an 
uh, um, like a barrier that starts from him, from him and that goes all the way to the end of the arena uh, in the direction he's facing. So this kind of cut any uh, any, any attempt of escape and uh, make a, an unpassable barrier for a while. So he's, re he's really fun to play, honestly. And uh, his ultimate power does feel epic to use. So it is the, mo the most powerful feeling of ultimate that we have so far. Nice. So, um, so yes, then the next ruler will be fun, I think. Uh, we have also a new... Uh, a, a new striker that is called Praxis. He is very small. <laughs> He's a tiny little guy that seems hyperactive and that always runs. Uh, uh, like uh, even when you don't run, you run. <laughs> He's really like he wants to move. <laughs> he looks like that. But honestly, is not as well nailed. I am not 100% satisfied yet with what we have with this guy. Um, he is uh, based a bit on vengeful. Uh, his ultimate power is actually the same thing as the right click of Negotiator, but it has unlimited range. Oh <laughs> so, wow! So it is, and it is much more powerful. So instead of being, so by putting it unlimited range and like making it super powerful, it becomes actually a striker power. <laughs> so this one is cool, but the secondary uh, is not is not nailed yet. So, uh, but yeah, we will have those uh, those um, eight characters. We were trying at first to have like 10, 11, but. Uh, we decided that we needed to fix too many things before starting to produce too many characters. So uh, yes, there will be eight characters. There will be uh, revamped AI. Malik has been working on it for two weeks on top now. So uh, there will be a completely revamped UI. There will be dedicated server um, and also a lot of gameplay tweak and uh, feedback improvement. So we are overhauling the entire ring around the character so you can read better what's happening. Uh, the grab feedback, the, 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 we make the disc clearer, we, we improve the sound, the secondary cooldown. So honestly, <laughs> massive freaking patch <laughs> that is nice. coming soon. So, That's yeah, awesome. That will be, yeah. So something I've been wondering about, um, we see these events that happen in the arena every now and then. Is there going to be uh, something added where maybe the viewers watching on Twitch are able to influence these events and be able to uh, cause them to start up? Uh, so this is uh, really the reason why this feature exists, is to go there. <laughs> Our nice. first design was really to make it happen, but like uh, uh, we, we are trying to prioritize as well as we can and before going there and creating those super cool uh, spectator options, uh, we, we, we really want to nail the core a bit better. But yes, uh, definitely this is something that uh, the reason why those even exist is so that, so we, actually we are thinking of uh, so much more depth in this. We want actually the, uh, so we are we are actually speaking with Twitch right now about those features and they nice. seem to be interested. So uh, we want, uh, for instance, when you join a Twitch channel that uh, the, the channel asks you who do you want to win, so who, who are you a fan of and actually um, the one team with the most fun would receive, I don't know, VFX or better towns or like the crowd and the banners in the stadium would go, like the, the, the stadium would be affected by the, by the real player watching it and they, it would kind of uh, really uh, make it clear who is the favorite and who is the underdog. <laughs> I would say also allow people, if they want to, to just vote for an individual player on the team instead of the entire team. Because if they're just a fan of one particular person, um, you know that'll that'll further help to uh, show you know oh this person's the star player. Yeah, so okay, it it is a good idea. We have considered also uh, like adding actually stuff like uh, where you can uh, almost uh, parachute stuff like in Hunger Game or I don't nice. know what. But uh, the thing is, there is a, you are aware there is a thirty second uh, delay. Yeah. And it ac it actually limits how much you can do those cool things. But uh, yes, we would really appreciate. Well, so if they ever remove this delay, which they said they would not, <laughs> if they ever remove it, uh, we would be proud to actually allow players to show their support and empower their favorite players. <laughs> and uh, also, so yes, and then uh, we, we, we want uh, to create much more event and uh, actually have the, the fans voting for which event will happen through the Twitch interface, so that, for instance, if, uh, if you know that, you, that your favorite team is really good in this kind of context and the other one is not, then you could you cannot like make them win per se, but you can at least decide 
um, which context will happen to kind of increase and like uh, even though it's not a theoretical advantage it could be a real advantage if they are more trained in the ice context or something so yeah we feel like by doing that we can make the spectator actually feel involved in backing their team and making something significant to make them to help them win so gotcha. yes we are exp yep that's really we are cool. definitely exploring that <laughs> I would say another thing is to get away from the issues with latency, you could also have it as a feature of observers watching the game through the game client. So that way, you know, they can also see it but be voting on things in real time. Uh, okay, you, you mean like building our own client? You well, you've, you've already got the, um, the ability to watch what's going on in the game, right? The, yeah, uh, the, the, the client mode. The so the, 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 sorry, the spectator mode. <laughs> yeah, so it would be basically building the ability to vote on things and do that sort of stuff into the spe in-game spectator mode. So if you want to be more in tune and then potentially having the, the Twitch channel uh, chat room available while you're watching, that would be another fun sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I, I really, you know, I like that there's Twitch integration is going to be more than just uh, an afterthought with the game. A lot of games that have Twitch integration, it really is just kind of an afterthought. Choice Chamber is a game where that is not the case. That's a game where pretty much the player is playing against the arena that's being voted on by the viewers. So that, that game, you need viewers to really be able to enjoy it properly. And that's part of the fun of it. But not very many games really have that much advanced integration with Twitch and I think it's a great thing even with the 30 second delay it's a um, it's a really big feature it really brings a lot to the table it allows the audience to get engaged I mean what I, I know probably at least 25 percent of um, football fans or um, you know soccer or baseball or whatever sport yell at the game yell at the TV because they have they think they have a better idea of what the coach should be doing in the situation or want to shout out the play that they think is coming next because they have such good knowledge of the playbook they want to be like all right I'll show you you know, you know calling it out and then the next play comes up oh yeah you see I called it and then you know making a game out of that sort of thing but you can't really you know log on to the chat channel for a TV station and that'd be impossible to do anything with anyway there'd be a million people chatting in there you would you know every line of text would be you know gone off into space by the time it you know it's already been typed and entered but the idea that you can have that much in you know interaction with the team because it's not you know, teams that are, have 10 million people watching them quite yet. I'm hoping eventually the game gets up to that point. But, um, you know, you've got a small team. you got maybe, you know, uh, on a, a good team on a good night, maybe a, a few thousand people watching. You can get a lot of um, people who are really feeling connected with the game and engaged, even if the team isn't actually able to really see a lot of what they're doing and communicate back to at least see that there's the feedback and that there's the support for them that's a big deal for a team and likewise for the team to you know or for the viewers to see that you know I can actually talk to the team and every now and then they'll give a shout out or maybe they'll even give one of the uh, the the team's um, custom decals or skins or hats or whatever that they give a special giveaways and I'll be able to win one just for watching them so you know a lot of a lot of really good stuff I can see between the the people playing the game and the community engaged in watching the game. Uh, th th that's funny you speak uh, so much about it because it is actually the first feature we have designed for this game was that the, we had no idea that it would be a 3v3 physics base uh, with a park. Uh, we, we had no clue what the game would be and yet we really wanted this, the one thing you are uh, explaining to happen. We Actually our challenge, our objective with this game was to kind of answer the question, what is the future of esports? What what does a game need to be the next big thing in esports? And we have kind of just started from this core question, and we have identified a couple of answers. And for instance, the the one topic we're speaking about is the fact that um, player uh, want to like the the fans want to kind of somewhat be an active part of 
they're, they want to kind of feel like they're making a difference and helping their team and that what they, they're, like their cheering is meaningful. And in, uh, in hockey, we call the crowd the seventh player. Yeah. In the, gladia in, in the gladiator arena, you, the crowd could decide whether someone sur survives or dies, right? And like the crowd wants to, the people, the fans want their voice to have a, a meaning and to create a difference. So this was one of our core principles. We wanted also it to be uh, watchable easily. We wanted like for anyone who does not understand, because right now uh, the biggest esports uh, are StarCraft and League of Legends. And honestly, those games are uh, maybe not StarCraft, but still it's it, not StarCraft anymore, but still it's still a big one. Yeah, and, well, uh, maybe not in the United States, but I think in um, like Korea, for example, I think it's still pretty huge. Yes, definitely, and uh, those games are awesome, honestly, but they are not kind of watchable for someone who does not master the game. They, for, 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 like, for, you could not like put it in a random bar and have the people cheer around it, right? They could not be like so mainstream that anyone can follow. So this is this was this is why we designed the game this way. We wanted it to be centered around a single focus that everyone understand a disc. Something that like because like uh, in the most big sports right now there is multiple things happening um, on the playground, with each with like various amount of impact on the general progress and victory uh, of the game. And it's hard to understand exactly what is good and how good is it and what what should I watch exactly. And that makes it that that makes it a bit uh, hard to, to watch for someone who is not used to the game. So this was another of our pillar. And actually what we did is really we kind of um, identified all the key things we felt like some like the future is part. Uh, and an another thing is we needed to be like soccer in the sense that everyone can get the basics within 30 seconds, one minute, right? In soccer, it's like, okay, you have to uh, push this thing in this zone. You got it, right? It's <laughs> it's as simple as like understand. And then there is still unlimited amount of depth. And this is why we kind of control this. Uh, we designed this analogical uh, contro direct control scheme where it is really easy to get. But at the same time, since since it's analogical and really based on your uh, your uh, hand movement, it creates for unlimited mastery potential. And uh, the the more you practice, the more you get increasingly good. And honestly, right now our our hardcore fan, I have no fucking chance to win against them because they have mastered it to such a bigger level. So we wanted it to be really so easy to watch, uh, active part of the spectator, easy to learn, hard to master. Uh, so actually, this is this was the initial uh, start, uh, thoughts behind the project, and then we just established those pillars, those value, and we tried to develop the game around around those concepts. And this is uh, what led to the, uh, the birth of uh, Arena Cyber Evolution, the, the way it became. We, want to, we also wanted it to be really teamwork oriented. This is why the fuel, the pass, the, the, way, the way that uh, uh, the game, the, 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 the power structure where you cannot really score alone, but there's still some improvement. So, uh, so yeah, this is uh, the, 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 the spectatorship, the accessibility were actually our core values. and. Uh, we we do believe that uh, honestly, if we do manage to make the dedicated server uh, work properly, we have something that has uh, like freaking crazy potential. At PAX Prime, people were just cheering and uh, uh, just queuing, and people kept coming back two or four times in a row. So in good condition right now, the game is is really really fun to play. Hello, did I lose connection? Uh, no, you didn't lose connection. I, I muted okay, because okay. I didn't want to uh, speak over you there. So we've actually got a couple active players in this game. Um, we've got a goalie and one of the uh, the strikers. So uh, let me watch. There is a. It's you mean in the op yeah in the in the match I'm playing right now. In the red or blue? The both of them are on the opposite team. Yeah. Okay. Have you realized that uh, it's not possible in this game to play as a red player? <laughs> nah, I didn't. Even, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> the cop now, when he calls his uh, drones, 
it, they now have like a police uh, alarm that rings and honestly it makes them much more epic it, re it really uh, makes it feel like a police uh, the police is coming <laughs> <laughs> Oh right! Oh no! Because the goalie wasn't in, or it wasn't in the uh, the goal area. I couldn't actually score there. Whoops! Come on, teammate! There we go! Ha ha! That's another point. Yeah, fun stuff. What was that cartoon-looking thing on the uh, the the thing at the top in the middle of the? Um, you know that that big viewer box that the 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 viewers watch or whatever. I saw something that looks like a cartoon. Uh, wh where the? You know, um, above the middle of the arena, where like the the big screens and stuff that the viewers would be watching. It looked like there yeah. was some sort of a cartoon playing up there or something or some. some Normally, sort of it is a viewport. It should show the camera watching at your character. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Yeah, we are trying to find ways to uh, because the characters are a bit small on screen, and we are trying to figure a better way to showcase them be uh, like better in the screen so that you can see uh, whatever your skin, your customization. Oh, is. oh man! I hit him with the explosion. He scored an own goal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a nice trick. Okay, so you're playing Vex Wicker, right? Yeah, it's so powerful. <laughs> that explosion is beefy. Oh, whoops. Oh well, we can recover. Oh, okay, I just saw it. <laughs> That's cool. Damn. <laughs> I'm out of explosions for the match, but I... It's going to be a really big upset for them to be able to score three more points in a couple of minutes here. Uh, if you play defensively a bit. Oh, I almost scored that if I was just a little bit later on it. I fired before I even got going because I know that goalie likes to rush ahead. Haha. -ha. Oh! Score! Good job, teammate. This is. Okay. I gotta say, this is a lot of fun. <laughs> Uh, th now the thing is with esports, oh, simple really is best in terms of something that people can watch and enjoy and you know talk about with their buddies. When I think about um, like street fighting games or even simpler like Nidhogg or um, uh, Hokra was another game that um, that was just like there's a goal here, there's a goal here. You've both got little um, paddle looking things. You can press a button to charge. You can press a button when you've got the ball to pass. And that's it. Just total minimalist eSport. Super awesome. Yeah, but I think that the, for me, the, the games I respect the most are those who uh, manage to have this one single almost button or control that you get it like instantly. And as you get good, good at using, you suddenly realize how much depth and how much possibilities and uh, like uh, option it, it opens. But it's really based on your understanding and of this power rather than on the complexity of the interface or, or, or whatnot. Right. And honestly, this this is what Nintendo, for instance, Nintendo freaking built a freaking empire based on the jump mechanic. Yeah, so that's what, true. This is, this is what they did. And uh, I really respect this type of approach, and uh, I, I, I think at that period we are definitely uh, Nintendo fans, or at least fans of what Nintendo has been in the past. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they're still doing a lot of good stuff. They're still, you know, starting... They're Actually, I feel like they've been getting better about supporting the indie community over the past few years. They, they are great. Honestly, Nintendo is a good company, and I... I, I, I was I was convinced that actually Wii U would be Oculus Rift when <laughs> before it, it went out, and it would have made total sense for them to make that because first they are the best when it comes to designing ergonomic experience that work that the player can understand. For instance, they took this Wii controller, this Wii remote, and they made tons of cool experience where in reality it actually didn't work. <laughs> 
So and they still managed to figure out how to make it work and like what they could make uh, 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 really that made sense with that, where no other company understood. So they are really the one company who could uh, figure how to leverage a 3D Oculus Rift-like type of uh, interface. If anyone can do it, it's really Nintendo because this <laughs> is the offline uh, ex user base experience. This is like their core expertise. I do believe like they are the best company in the world to make it happen. Plus, they have tried, tried, they have started to experiment with it in the time of Virtual Boy, which failed yeah. as much as the the Power Glove did fail. Power Glove was yeah. the the NES. ancestor of the Wii of the Wii Remote, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so Power Glove is to be remote what Virtual Bluff, uh, Virtual Boy could have been to Oculus Rift or whatever they, they choose to call it. And uh, I was really convinced that their their move, the one thing that should they should have done for the next step is to be the first one to make a 3D virtual reality esque. Uh, 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 but they did not. They actually. Uh, but so, so 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 you figured what they tried to do, right? With the with the with the Wii U. They kind of uh, thought, okay, the 3DS sells really freaking well, so let's try to have it in the living room, the dual the dual screen experience. So we'll be able to uh, to kind of uh, port everything we learned from the 3DS in the living room, and hence we will make a super successful console as well. So they went somewhat for a safe choice, even though it proved that safe safe uh, safety is not always. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I. But the other thing is, though, Nintendo, among all of them, has been very much about being the most family friendly and kid friendly of all of the consoles. The um, GameCube controller, for example, big red A button in the middle because that's what drives the action. Um, and then the next biggest button next to it is the, the B button to cancel out, which is also going to be the easiest one to reach. So even in the design of the controller, it's meant to be intuitive and simple and easy for anybody to get into. Beyond that, they very rarely have games that are like super violent and graphic. Um, usually the most graphic their games get is, you know, minimal blood and guts or, um, you know, sports games, which are, you know, a different kind of violent. But um, I would say that they, they really focus on a lot more, like, titles and, and content that is playable by everybody and enjoyable by everybody. Um, the the Wii, not even talking about Wii U, but just the Wii itself, the the sports resort or whatever, the the little sports nine pack games that the uh, console came with, and they had another one later. Those were super fun. They're very simple graphics. They're just using your little uh, me character, which I think is also smart that you can make your own avatar and play it in games. You know, that's really engaging. Um, but you know, it, it, it's just that everything that they're trying to do is trying to move, move forward in one direction while at the same time keeping to their core mechanics of, you know, making things user friendly and kind of family friendly. Yeah, but actually this is uh, interesting because it's, uh, so you're right. And it is actually the result, uh, because most of current successful studio, not all of them, but most of them in their uh, development and creative approach are extremely top-down in the sense that they come with this vision. Imagine you are this guy who's trying to survive and it will use like the uh, Resident Evil type of shooting or the, metal, the, the Gears of War cover and shoot, but it will be in this post-apocalyptic world. So it, it starts with this vision, right? And then the mechanic are built to reinforce those, uh, those narrative concepts. And actually Nintendo and Spearhead as well is bottom-up. They don't have most of the time the vision uh, of what they're trying to do. They have prototypes, they have mechanics uh, that work and that create like cool feeling and that have depth and that are fun. They, 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 they create cool toys actually. And then the, their graphic and the, the, the packaging they, they put, uh, like the visual they put around it is actually meant to help the player understand what their mechanics are. It is meant to help player understand what the mechanics are about and like increase their ergonomy. So they actually don't fulfill the same role at all. The graphics in the case of Nintendo are meant 
to uh, help the player understand the core mechanics that when the, that that when we were designed had actually no uh, intent other than being a cool toy that is fun to manipulate. So this is this is why uh, you can feel such a big difference. It's actually a complete different train of thoughts that leads to their graphic compared to someone who is trying to make an immersive experience that will convey this nar this narrative uh, concept. So, uh, so uh, they they are actually. Uh, I think that I, I think that the fr the family friendliness is back is because what they're trying to nail is we want it to be easy to understand, ergonomic, understood by everyone. As opposed to, we wanted to, uh, we want to convince the player that he is uh, a badass, uh, shotgunning people in the face uh, in this post-apocalyptic world. <laughs> right. For sure. Uh, one second, I will get some more coffee. <laughs> Okie dokie. Whoops. Did not catch that pass. Nice. Scoring on these two play in. Looks like this time they um, they allowed the computer to play the goalie, which was a wise decision. I back. <laughs> Welcome back. Are you really from Are you really from Holland? No. <laughs> No, that's just my last name. Okay. All right. Yeah, we um, we kind of have an interesting situation here because me plus two computer players is going to be better than these two level threes and their one um, computer goalie. So which means that you have become super good. <laughs> no, if I played against that level nineteen who smoked me the other day, I don't. I you know, I think I'd still fare about the same. Man, they they were super upgraded too. Yeah, some of our players have become so fucking good. It's it's just insane. <laughs> I I I have tried the last time I tried to play against one of our fans, he just uh, crushed me 15-0. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I mean that's you know there, there's only so much time you get to have mastery of the game there's some games where I can understand the person who made it being the most knowledgeable and most able to uh, complete it like if I made a roguelike for example I would know kinda what the progression of things is how difficult things are how tough I need to be to be able to take things on the patterns of the enemies so you know if I was playing rogue or Dungeon Mans, or you know, one of the many awesome roguelikes out there. Um, I'm not going to have the same uh, knowledge as the person who made it, but this, um, there isn't really that much to know. It's more techniques, tactics, reflex, and if you're working with AI, it's kind of learning how to use the AI and trick the AI, like I just did. Like I demonstrated the last time the goalie's not really good about the run defense there um. yeah it, it is it is very skill centric honestly like there is not much more to understand in the game than w what you do already understand <laughs> if you played like a couple of games <laughs> and uh, but the thing is uh, there is actually much more depth when we we kind of interviewed the the, the champion of the last tournament and there is a, actually what we realize that really makes the difference is the uh, the, the team play, the synergy, the way that the player coordinate themselves and they work as a team. So having the skill is a really important thing. But then what really makes the difference is does your skill is inscribed in a like current tactic that you all buy into or not? And uh, this is honestly what made the difference because. There was two or three teams that had like a super expert striker that would never miss, and in their case, they did not have a super star player. But uh, um, what really made the difference is that they did practice as a team three hours per day, and they were they were That's strong big time. as a. Yeah. <laughs> that's huge. That's so much. <laughs> that's that's a lot yeah. of professional quality practice to be getting in. They really must have wanted that win. What what was yeah, the prize did. for the first tournament? 
<laughs> well, they earned it. Yeah, they definitely earned it. <laughs> and, and, and another subtle tactic that I did not realize that ex that exists in the game is the way the camera works. Uh, so the camera, what it will do is it will just make sure to always frame you and the puck. <laughs> mm. So uh, if you if you go away from the puck, uh, the camera will zoom out, which kind of means that. The goaler, when he is a def in a defensive uh, stance, tends to have um, a more zoomed out camera, which means like a better overview of the whole uh, action. And uh, this was... Okay, you're fucking crushing them. Yeah, I know. It's, that, it's the same guys that I played in the last game, but like I said, they left it up to the computer to do the goalie, which goalie can block my shots really well, but if I just run it up in there, they can't do anything about it. Yes, th this is this is uh, this is being addressed. There is actually uh, a trigger that does not work. <laughs> uh, okay, so and so 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 for me, I was just amazed that uh, the subtlety of how the camera works would imply that since the goaler has a better overview most of the time, he would be in charge of coordinating the action for the two others by giving them the information that they cannot see. <laughs> yeah, so, no, that's I great. Would, I think yeah, that's really smart. I would, I was really impressed by the level of finesse of their rationale behind the, the strategy and the tactic they would use. Yeah. So here's here's a question. Um, right now it appears everybody runs backward with the disc as they approach because you know you don't want to have the disc grabbed out of your hands. But at the same time, it seems like. Um, I, I don't know if it would be better or worse, but it almost seems like you would want to have more speed going forward, so that way it's the trade-off that you're more vulnerable, that someone can grab the puck from you easier, or the disc rather, but um, you know, if you turn around before they get close enough, they can't get you with it, or they can't hit the, the disc in your hands with one of their projectiles. You know, because they're just going to hit you in the back and it's not going to do anything. So oh, shit, it really sounds like a super fucking awesome idea. Okay, no, but honestly, uh, yes, shit. Uh, I don't know why we did not try it. <laughs> I'll I'll say this though. At the same time, it means you're more dangerous because uh, when you're in scoring range, because you're going to potentially be going faster than um, you know you normally would because you're you're now heading towards the goal with the. Uh, the disc, and I'm not sure if that that would make things more difficult in a good way or not. But something that you could also do is weight the amount of speed for what direction you're going based on where you're at on the board. Maybe if you're on your side of the board, you'll move faster if the, the disc is headed forward, versus when you're on the opponent's side, you'll move faster if the disc is headed towards your goal. So that way, it it kind of encourages you to be more defensive, but you also can't just run straight at the goal and not have other people catch up to you. So it... it okay, seriously, there, there's really a level of... Uh, uh, I, I, do, I do like your first idea of saying, like, potentially having your character who... Like, having a risk-reward concept where you take more risk, then you have more reward. So if you play really offensively, then... You you get a bit faster. There is kind of a level of depth I feel that could really be added. So we I feel like there is not quite enough ad, like mastery uh, compared to what I would like. And I do like those kind of idea. I I, re, I really like I really like this uh, suggestion. Uh, actually, I will ensure we test it next next week. <laughs> nice. I guess it would actually uh, be um I, uh, the the way I'm kind of thinking about it in my head is maybe. Um, the if the angle that you're facing is the angle that you're moving, you move at 100% speed. If the angle that you're facing is opposite the angle that you're moving, you move at, say, 90 or 95% speed. And somewhere between that, there's a bit of a gradient. So if you're only sideways, not fully forward or back, then you're still going to be moving somewhere halfway between the the 100% speed and the 90% speed or whatever it would be. Uh, so that way people can kind of wait it a little bit instead of running with the disc fully forward. They can kind of have it off to the side a little bit. They can try to juke players by having the disc one way, thinking, making them think, oh, well, the player's going to keep going that way because they're going to try to outrun me. 
and then when the person commits to that direction they swing around the other way and they've already got that person committed that way so they can sneak around um, yeah it is very smart uh, I'm not sure if it will concre co concretely wor work but it's definitely definitely worth giving it a try <laughs> yeah. or not even necessarily if you have the disc whether or not you have the disc it could potentially you know work that way so that way, it, it, I guess it also rewards you if you're charging straight at someone, you're trying to grab the uh, disc from them, you're going to be moving at top speed versus um, if you're trying to kind of back up a little bit and maybe be able to catch it, but, um, you know, trying to set up for an intercept sort of thing, then I could see you maybe moving just a slight bit slower. So yeah, it, definitely different ways that you guys can approach it here. That sounds cool. Uh, yes, it's... Uh... Another thing that uh, we're not using uh, that uh, we, I realized this week is uh, the distance between your cur your cursor and your character. So uh, so I just realized that we are not using this uh, notion at all. So potentially there could be something where you could also tweak the strength of your shot based on how far the cursor is from your character. So it would kind of not slow down the pace, but uh, still add somewhat a bit of depth and uh, a bit of more mastery to to get. But I never uh, I never thought about like using the character facing to influence and affect uh, the movement, and it's uh, it's actually very smart. <laughs> yeah, actually, the idea of using the uh, the cursor to uh, the, the pointer to add more action to the things that really sounds great because you can have things where you put a line across the ground and it slows people down if they go through it or um being able to at, put the vector down for the approach of some projectile that comes off from the side or something a lot of stuff like that could definitely come from it or you know just just having something where you shoot and then you've got the mouse cursor somewhere and when you use your ability it homes in on where the cursor's at maybe there's a little indicator that that you're using the ability so someone can try to uh respond to it or maybe it has limited range so it can't be used to you know, hook a shot all the way around the arena or whatever. Um, another idea, uh, different types of discs. Um, we have the, the the current type of disc. I could see ones that are heavier, see ones that maybe are bouncier, uh, or ones that slow, you know, they, they throw really fast, but uh, as soon as they hit a wall, they just stop there. Um, all sorts of different variations. One that it's got a little bit of a kind of squiggle to it, so no matter where it's being used and how it's being used, it's always kind of a little off, like an unbalanced sort of disc. Um, that that sort of stuff. Okay. Um, that, that, that's really interesting as well. Uh, it, it would be, the, the cool thing with the disc is this is definitely for us super easy to make. <laughs> like yeah. to just change the parameter, change the weight, change the bounciness, change the, like the size. <laughs> And uh, like, potentially, if it's interesting, it could add a more variety. Uh, if if uh, each game would have different object, it would not make it harder to read, and yet it would kind of add the more variety for n not too much investment for for our part. So, uh, yeah. so I, I I I am not sure one hundred percent about this one though, because like if uh, there is like a substantially different disc, uh, how will it affect? Uh, players learning curve in the sense that will they be able to uh, kind of master the game and understand well what's happening if the ball change every every match but I've at the got, same time but I've got the answer to that the disc is okay. always the default one unless all the players in the match are level 5 or higher then them or perhaps the v the viewers can vote on what the disc is going to be for the next match, or even change the disc maybe at like a halftime or you know between scores or something. Once you're at level ten, uh, everybody in the match is level ten or higher. It's uh, maybe two or three different discs that you can select from. When you're all the way up to level twenty, maybe there's five or six different discs because at that point there is an, is an issue with mastery. You, you've gone up to level 5, you know how to use the regular disc. You've gone up to level 10, you know how to use the, the two discs. You know, and then by the time you're at level 20, five discs, that's probably not too much to master, and I think it'll add 
really a lot more flavor to the game and um, give people a lot more. Not not that there isn't already a lot of fun stuff and a lot of variation and a lot of the variation that comes from the tactics, but this is definitely one more element that could be added. And whether it's a um, a viewer feature that's added or a, um, a a player feature that they just vote on, or it could be a combination of the two. Um, I think that could be really, really awesome, and definitely, if it's if it's something that's not a very difficult feature to put in, be something that that could really kind of push the I guess end game sort of thing. That once people already understand everything, to really start learning like, okay, what's the fine tuning of the um, the the heavy disc when you use it during the ice event? And just getting really good at that, so when those two things come up, they can really dominate the other team. That is really great stuff. I am right now sending an email to me to myself to, <laughs> to ensure <laughs> that those things will get tested. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's really great. It's really great stuff. <laughs> I would almost say just you know put it out. You know, says, once I've got the uh, the interview here up on YouTube, just send it to everybody on the team. Say hey. We got a lot of good ideas here. <laughs> no, no, I will tell. I had ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's some awesome stuff. I mean, there's so much already going well with the game. Now, on and this, this is, menu, this is why like opening the game makes so much sense because we have so much like our face uh, in the project that like just having someone else that has like a better uh, uh, perspective and like who has a fresh look on it. Uh, like can just open uh, our eyes on, some, on something that we just forget to see anymore. <laughs> so, uh, so that's really that's really great. <laughs> yeah, movement speed bonus after a successful pass. Well, why wouldn't I want to do that? <laughs> that seems awesome. It's a. Uh, it it is some okay. <laughs> we are redoing every icon. <laughs> we feel like those drawing gives you so no clue <laughs> about what the thing is doing. But what the thing is doing is uh, it's actually. I am not quite sure honestly about the design of this one, but it is actually uh, meant to be a support implant, where when you do pass to someone else, it it uh, it it uh, increases his speed. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's what I want. I think that's awesome. That's that's a, yeah. a really great feature because if you know if I'm passing it and they're they're in scoring range, they're going to be able to sneak by the goalie that much faster. Let's see if those players are still on. If I'll be able to get another game. Actually, I kind of want to see what observe is like because I haven't done that yet. Let's see. They don't have a game going. I wonder if they're they're viewers that just don't want to pipe in in the chat room here. <laughs> but. All right. So, what what of the menu that I'm seeing here and all of this is stuff that you're going to change, or is this stuff that you've already worked on? Because it seems pretty solid and pretty intuitive already. Uh, we are reworking everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, uh, I so first, okay, <laughs> I'll tell you what is the biggest flaw I feel. Uh, so the two biggest flaws, in my opinion, are um, so the most like in your face way to buy things right now is through the store that is in the lobby. <laughs> so there is a uh, there is a thing uh, called customization, but uh, like our metrics tells us that almost no player click on that. So actually, our most popular store in the game is in the lobby. And uh, the lobby is a 60 second period. <laughs> and uh, the fact that you can buy stuff there is really not obvious. Honestly, there's like 10 layer of defense to prevent player from, from buying. First, they have 60 second. Second, it's, there's no name, uh, there's no name on, the, on, the, on the slots. So it's not easy to understand what is what in the store. Third, uh, when we released, there was no way to buy. Uh, so when you release the game, uh, everyone was in developer mode, so even if they did buy, it would not spend their money and it would not grant us money. <laughs> Fourth, uh, like the only way to spend money was to have American dollars. It would not work on the other uh, types of wallet. <laughs> so we were kind of in this, uh, like, okay, we really made this, these 12 layers of barrier to prevent anyone from being able to pay. 
<laughs> so uh, this is this is one thing. The other thing is uh, no one ever equips implant almost. It feels like uh, uh, the way it's presented, it's not very compelling. It's not clear what does what does what. How do you equip your implants? How do you, they affect your character? Uh, so and uh, we keep seeing these match with players that are level 15 or 20 and they don't even like equip implants. <laughs> So um, we decided to really refactor it to um, clarify uh, <clears throat> what the implant do, clarify what it does when you upgrade them, uh, add more uh, feedback on the fact that you equip them, and just, just and honestly, just a huge ergonomy pass to uh, make this uh, process more will, clear. Will we have the ability to make and select quick builds like this hat, this outfit, and this implant is my you know, ultra defense goalie, this hat, this uh, uh, outfit, and this um, implant is my um, kind of mid-range heavy striker defensive sort. You know, basically like two or three different configurations you have for uh, uh, the negotiator. And then when you're on the selection screen here, you click on negotiator and then you click like one, two, three or F1, F2, or F3 or something like that. And you can just choose one of your configurations that's already set. But for, for the next, uh, for the next build, what we will have in this direction that we don't yet have is that every runner will remember which skin and hat and implants, uh, that you, that you selected. So that you, if you uh, want to reuse the same build, it will be saved. And if you switch character, each character will remember what build you had last time you played him. So at, it, this will already be an improvement. Having different uh, setup per character, uh, this is something we've been discussing, but we felt like already at least having each character having their own build would be uh, would do a, a, a big, uh, a long way uh, toward this uh, because. Most of the time, uh, you have your strategy with Negotiator, you have your strategy with Vengeful Star, and uh, th there will be just slight variation, because if you want to play... Uh, but I, do, I do agree that uh, it would be nice to have different, uh, different build possibilities, in the sense that you might be a total Negotiator fan, and even when you play Striker, you play Negotiator Striker, <laughs> and you have like your, your build uh, around this idea, but uh, for now, uh, it will not be part of the next uh, of the next push, but at least at least you will have a build uh, a build safe per character, and you will be able from the store or from the menu to uh, define your build before the match starts. So, so it will be already quite much better. <laughs> awesome. Yep. That's gonna be really cool. When when do you uh, plan to have the? Is it all going to be one major uh, UI overhaul pass, interface overhaul, or is it going to be kind of iterations uh, as each feature gets completed? So it will be a massive uh, UI overhaul. It's, uh, I would say it's 70% done now. <laughs> and uh, it will happen, uh, I think we will make it public November 3rd, but if I say November 3rd, we might be a bit late, so maybe November 5th, <laughs> something like that, but uh, during this week, uh, the, the first week of November. Gotcha. But yeah, honestly, uh, the the new UI is really uh, it's it's ten, it's ten, ten times uh, more polished and more ergonomic, so I think that this will be, uh, this, will be uh, this will make a noticeable, noticeable difference. <laughs> Man, that's really weird. So this game's got some latency to it, if you've noticed. And you are playing versus bots, or what? No, are, I'm are playing against host? another player. I don't know who's the host. Oh, I... yes. So it means that you are not the host. Okay. Right now, I, I watch the, the match, and you are not the host. Oh, so this isn't on the uh, dedicated server yet. No, the dedicated server also will happen on November 3rd. Gotcha. Very cool. Very cool. That's... that's coming up really really soon yeah oh <laughs> looks like they uh, gave up or something yes this is this, this is another of the issue of having one of the player being the host <laughs> if he quits it, it, it kills the game no what I'm saying is I think they they walked away for a moment there okay oh there they are now they're back weird 
So oh. uh, I will have to uh, to go soon. No, uh, I have a dinner in like uh, 30 minutes. So. Oh yeah, no, I I completely get you. That's that's all good. Uh, what's for dinner? <laughs> what what what? I said what's for dinner. Uh, there is a okay, but there is my uh, childhood friend who now uh, is working in Israel, <laughs> and he just comes back uh, like once or twice a year, and uh, we are going to the one place we really enjoyed when we were uh, almost teenager. It's called. Uh, uh, Dragon Rouge. It means a uh, red red dragon. It's a it's a medieval type of restaurant where everyone is disguised as uh, like uh, medieval people and they they play music and it, it's it's like the the most festive restaurant you can ever go. Nice. <laughs> the people are just shouting and playing music and it, it's, it's just yeah. super fun. And they actually serve you beer in a cauldron and you have like a huge spoon to drink it. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, it's really nice. It's a really nice place. <laughs> it, it's it's kind of like um, we have a mid medieval times out here. It's kind of what it sounds like. Um, it's a, a kind of a restaurant that has well, it's a place that has all sorts of it's like restaurant and show and all sorts of stuff. There's like the little jousting and stuff that they have in the uh, in the middle in the dirt. You get big old muttons and stuff that's really cool i'm glad that uh so is, is it a local thing or is it a franchise the one it is it is the local but uh, the the owner has a couple restaurants uh, that are based on similar concepts so there's one for uh, the uh, the time the time period when uh, the uh, the first columns uh, arrived in America. So uh, I don't know what's the name of this per time period, but he, he does these historical uh, restaurants that are made to look and feel and serve the food from a certain time period. <laughs> oh, like a colonial sort of thing. Gotcha. So yeah, colonial, yeah. So we, we have the colonial. Uh, <laughs> we've we've got the official disconnect from the uh, host here, and unfortunately, clicking on. The, uh, so the this is this is the huge issue, and this is really <laughs> why we need this freaking discounted server to happen. <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of funny. Oh well, it's fine. Like a level eleven that's getting beat on that bad, it's fine that they rage quit. I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna hold what it. What level are you? Uh, I think I'm level six now. Okay, so yeah, you are kind of. Uh, you are ahead in terms of uh, progression. <laughs> I would say the skill th skill level. It, it it's not just that, but I feel like I really understand the game and I I can do really good work as a striker. Yeah, uh, definitely. I you kind of uh, really real realize uh, you picked up on this exploit. Uh, that run. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, oh, but yeah, and. Uh, that that's the thing though is if it was not as good at blocking my shots, um, I wouldn't be able to do the run because it would be better at anticipating when I try to run it in. Right now, it's going somewhere because it knows. Oh shoot! He if he tries to shoot, there's this entire field that he can be shooting. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put myself in a place where I can grab it. But when I get closer, it doesn't go. Oh crap! I gotta you know jump on him right now, otherwise he's about to score right in my face. <laughs> yeah, there's, it's because there is one of his uh, AI trigger that does not fix in. Uh, there, there's a bug. <laughs> yeah, once once that gets worked out, I'm sure it'll definitely be a uh, uh, a much more challenging experience. But then again, that'll also give more opportunity to then pass it back to one of my teammates and have them try to score it um, from the other angle. So that's that's definitely something I'll be really excited for and uh, really have a fun time trying out that and the own goal thing when they're right at the edge and they're like next to the goal and they turn a little bit and put the uh the disc in the goal that that ai thing <laughs> is kind of silly but i know that'll yeah this uh, is horrible when it happens oh my gosh yeah <laughs> i gotta say though it's it's pretty convincing like they they seem like they're playing pretty competently I there's some situations where i can get leverage on them and there's some situations where I get no leeway whatsoever. If I try to do a pass even close to an AI, they they automatically grab it. They're they're pretty much right on top of it. So um, 
And I guess that's one of the advantages of players, is that they're, they're more tactical in different ways, but they're also more fallible in different ways. So it's a completely different experience. Yeah, but, it's really something we're really learning a stuff right now. And this is a type of game and a type of AI we've never we never did before. So we are really learning it as we do it. And, uh, and yeah, I think that the next iteration will be uh, really uh, much stronger uh, on every aspect. <laughs> it was actually the first time we ever did sport AI. So <laughs> like trying to figure the teamwork, the f the fact that they need to anticipate a bit the, the other team's movement, the fact that they need to switch from defensively to uh, to offensively. All the all these concepts are kind of alien to us. But uh, I think we are. I think we are get we are getting on the top of it now. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure if if it was a game about um, pushing uh, peasants out of the way while you sneak through a crowd, like that AI, I'm sure you guys would absolutely like nail yeah. in a week. But this is a completely different beast. <laughs> so yeah, on that I'll note, uh, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, Oh. Uh, no, it's because I was in charge of the AI on Assassin's Creed 2, so uh, yes, definitely, uh, <laughs> this is something that, uh, oh my god, <laughs> I, have, I have a very, very specific, precise expertise for this type of AI. <laughs> I have actually a skill set that, uh, that has no use except for this one game, but... <laughs> but still, uh, it kind of... Um, I, I, it, it kind of... Uh, a project that I give at least a bit of help on every year, so I suppose that it is not an obsolete skill set. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, no, it's because like that's e really even cool. this e even this year, I went uh, I went to uh, give a help a bit a hand on uh, Assassin's Creed to help them finish it. So <laughs> gotcha. So so my so so my uh, my expertise of the very specific uh, type of AI you mentioned is not obsolete yet. <laughs> Actually, I would say it's quite the opposite. I think games are probably going to start doing it for more things than just, you know, sneaking around and defeating the Templars. I can't remember. Are you defeating the Templars or are you the Templars? I, I have not played enough of the yeah. Assassin's Creed games. Oh, really? Uh, but because normally you are the Assassins, and uh, which are the sworn enemies of Templars. This is what Assassin's Creed is about. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, it, this year, though, there will be two Assassin's Creed, one set in Paris that follows the same formula, and there's also one set in uh, the in New York, I think, or at least in the north in the northeast of America. And uh, in this case, you play the Templar for the first time, so you kind of fight assassins and you kill assassins. <laughs> Interesting. Well, that'll definitely be a, uh, a different experience for folks, but um, yeah. That'll be that'll be a lot of fun for, for everybody to look forward to. I definitely want to let you get going to dinner here. We're actually getting pretty much towards the end of the time here, so um gonna definitely start wrapping up here. So everybody, anybody who's watching here on YouTube, anybody sticking around in chat here, I am legendary neurotoxin. Uh this awesome, awesome fella. Uh, Simon, I'm going to butcher your last name, so please give us your first and last one time for the folks. Small, by, in English, you would pronounce it uh, Simon Darvo. <laughs> Simon, in, Fr in French, we say Simon Darvo, so we don't pronounce the R the same way, but uh, yeah, Simon Darvo, Darvo, the E-A-U part of it is just pronounced simply O. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Very cool. Very so uh, yeah, that that, that 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 was really nice, and I would really enjoy if you are available doing it again. Maybe uh, when we uh, release the next push or something, so we can discuss about the updates and what is coming uh, in the. Because honestly, the next push will do a great deal of preparing uh, most of the technical uh, um, aspect, improve the ergonomy, make the progression more satisfying. But I do believe that the real important, meaningful push will be the one after it because we want to actually introduce a ranking system that will allow players to progress through leagues and like set themselves uh, uh, compared to the rest of the community and have like those seasons that start going. So it will, it will not be part of the early November push, but definitely it will be part of the one push after this one. <laughs> awesome. Very cool. Yeah, absolutely. As as Lord Wiki here is saying, thank you very much for coming, and it was a great interview. Really, really 
I had a pleasure talking with you. You know, even like that first 45 minutes where we weren't even talking about the game at all, that was that was a lot of good conversation. I, I really enjoy what we got to talk about there. I'm definitely excited to be able to talk with you more when you got, you know, when the next big tournaments go in and when more as more features keep coming through. And, you know, just in general, I'd love to be able to get a game going with uh, uh, Spearhead on the uh, dedicated server just to kind of test my skills a little bit against a bit of a seasoned team. And, uh, yeah, should be a lot of fun. But this is, this is definitely wrap-up time, so if you folks want to try this game, this awesome game from Spearhead Games, Arena Cyber Evolution, just go on Steam and download it. It's free! It is free. Definitely get a piece of it. And on that note, we are going to be wrapping up. So, thank you all very much for coming. I will see you all uh, Monday for more Who's Gaming Now action. And, of course, next uh, Saturday, more interviews. So see you then. Ciao, guys.